our screen. Okay, so we were talking about colonophomology. Let me review where I was. So I'll go back over the same ground again. We start with a bracket polynomial rewritten uh, this way uh, with uh, a variable q. And uh, then this uh, will normalize, as I've indicated, with a factor of minus one to the number of negative crossings and q to the number of positive crossings minus twice the number of negative crossings. And we're using enhanced states. So that means that at the outset, the state circles are also endowed with plus and minus signs. So that, for example, to evaluate a single loop, it's q plus q inverse, one q for the plus a designated loop and one Q inverse for the minus designated loop and add them up. That means that the bracket polynomial looked at this way is the sum over enhanced states giving a one monomial term for each enhanced state. And you're going to have minus one to the number of B smoothings because that's the only place where a minus sign occurs. Just going over these again. Um, one minus sign for each B smoothing. And Q is going to be contributed by the number of B smoothings plus uh, the number of uh, 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 terms that uh, are labeled plus, the number of circles labeled plus, minus, the number of circles labeled minus. So that's what this J is. J is the number of B smoothings plus the number of circles that are labeled plus, plus the minus, the number of circles that are labeled minus. And if I count the number of states that have a given contribution, IJ, uh, and call that a module uh, generated by those states, uh, why then the number of them is the dimension of that module by definition. And the bracket polynomial has this look. Um, we also mentioned that indeed the binomial theorem is now subsumed into the assignments of signs. So for example, if I had two circles, then the, we have four possibilities, and if you add up their contributions, you get Q plus Q inverse squared, all that working out. Um, and, and that, uh, I'm repeating myself, but I wanted to get to this point, yes. So uh, if we rewrite the monomial sum as a sum over the contributions of the powers of Q and, uh, and an interior sum for a given such J, the sum over the I's. And remember, the I's are the number of states with that many B smoothings. Then this looks like an Euler characteristic. And it will be an Euler characteristic because we're going to define a boundary mapping from Cij to Ci plus 1j. And so this degree here is going to be called the homological degree. And that's counting just the number of B smoothings, remember. And the J is this, multi, is this combined count of number of B smoothings, number of plus loops minus number of minus loops. And it's going to turn out that the boundary mapping doesn't change the J, but it moves I up by one, and that's the chain complex. And so, we can rewrite the bracket polynomial as a sum of Q to the J times the Euler characteristic of the J chain complex. And that's the one that will have a homology. And so it will be the Euler characteristic of that homology. And there are, there are as many homologies here as there are values of J. 
on the bracket polynomial in this form, the coefficients are Euler characteristics of the homology. And that's the Kravana homology. So how did we get this um, boundary mapping? Let's go over it again. Uh, we, we could get it and we will uh, look at it this way at first, that we're just looking for a boundary mapping that keeps the J fixed. So in order to have the J remain fixed, you will notice that since the J, uh, since the number of B smoothings goes up by one, the number of loops minus the number of negative loops had better go down. So you can keep that in mind as what the homology is supposed to do. It's supposed to make this number go down by one. And then we can examine what could happen with loops. Those, the each individual loop is a genera, each state is a, is a, or with labels on it, is a generator of the chain complex. So here's an example. Uh, and I have lambda equals two here, two plus signs. And when I, when I um, shift uh, the bound, do the boundary, I'm going to take an A smoothing to a B smoothing. So in this case, two loops become one loop. And I have to have lambda go down by one. So the only possibility for that one loop labeling, assuming that all other loops in the state are left alone, um, and you only make this one small change, is that I should have a plus sign. On the other hand, if I have a plus sign and a minus sign, then I have zero, and that has to go down, so this will have to be labeled minus. And if I have two minuses, then I have no way to make it go down further, and so I'll make it zero. And this becomes the definition, the local definition of the boundary operator uh, on the homology. So uh, you can see that this looks like a bit of algebra. Uh, where if I take one as the plus label, then plus acts as an identity, and I will let x correspond to the minus label. And then you see that uh, one times one is one, and one times x is x, and x times x is zero. So, so far, I'm looking at the following ring, assuming that I have integer coefficients z of x modulo x squared. And that's the multiplicative structure in that ring. And that corresponds to circles melding into single circles. On the other hand, it could happen that when you do an A smoothing, you go from, I think someone has their microphone open. Um, if you would close it, it will make the background noise less. Um, if you have a single circle, uh, then uh, and an A, then it becomes two circles under the B smoothing. And if you had an X labeling it, that's a minus one, then two X's will work fine to give you minus two. So X should go to X, X. And that says that delta of X, if you think of this as a coproduct, is X tensor X. So we're thinking of that as a coproduct from the module, which is generated by labels on a single circle to the tensor product of that module with itself. On the other hand, uh, if we had it labeled one, then you see one can go to zero by uh, one tensor x or x tensor one. And so we take them both and define that the, the delta of one shall be one tensor x plus x tensor one, or that the boundary of this will be that. For the moment, think of the boundary as just defined mod two. I'll explain what the formula is over the integers in a moment, but those will be the mod two formulas. And this gives rise to a little algebra, which has a coproduct in it as well as a product. And that turns out to be a Frobenius algebra. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment, but that encapsulates an algebra with this coproduct and this product. That encapsulates the structure of the boundary map for this complex. And up to telling you about the signs, which I have a feeling I didn't write into the slideshow for the, over the integers, 
uh, we have now defined the Kovana homology. That is, let's remind ourselves what it is we've defined. For any given knot diagram, like in this case, this, these are the states of a trefoil knot diagram, uh, there is the collection of states. And you can start with the states, the state that's labeled by all A's, and then at, um, and one by one, change to B. So a morphism in this category that I'm creating goes from one, uh, and a generating morphism goes from a state that has a certain number of A's and B's to having one more B, like here, BAA to BAB, and so on, going from left to right. So in the vertical direction of this diagram, you have the same number of Bs. And so the chain complex consists in what is generated by this state, that's the zeroth one, then the first one, upper, upper index one, J equals one, is the direct sum of, of, the, of the modules that correspond to these loops. Then the um, C2, corresponds to the direct sum of the modules corresponding to these states. And that means that we have V tensor V, where V is that little ring, K of X modulo X squared, um, V tensor V, and then finally V tensor V tensor V all the way over here. The number of Vs in the tensor products and what gets summed depends on the structure of the link. But the background picture of it is always a cube like this with that structure of morphisms. Now I can tell you verbally, even though I didn't put it in writing in this slideshow, I should, I will put it in writing when I put the slideshow over onto the Dropbox. But you would like to know uh, what the sign should be uh, for any one of these morphisms. I've defined them without sign <coughs> and uh, and then the boundary of an element in this module is going to be equal to the sum with appropriate signs of these mappings on that element. So this is the direct sum, which corresponds to C1. And if you had an element in here and you called this one boundary one, boundary two, boundary three, then boundary one of X plus or minus boundary two of X plus or minus boundary three of X is going to be the boundary of it. So the arrows going out create the boundary by taking their sum. Similarly, from here, the sum of these two arrows is the boundary from here. And the sum of these three arrows out of the direct sum is the boundary here. At any given stage, there's a collection of arrows that define the boundary from one part of the chain complex to the next. So go back to the cube for a moment and you can then see what's going to be the assignment of boundary. Suppose you go from here to here. You have an A and an A and a B, and you switch this one. That one's at the beginning, no sign. But look at this one, where you switch to an A, and there is no preceding A. Again, a plus sign. But I want to find another example, and then you'll see what I'm talking about. Here, look at that one. In this one, you, um, you switched this A, um, wait a minute. You oh, I need a better example. Where's my example? Two A's and a B, there. Okay, here I go A, A, B to A, B, B. And this A is preceded by an A. That will get a minus sign. In general, you're going to have a string of A's and B's, and you're going to be changing a certain A. You look to the left of it and see how many A's precede it, and you get a minus sign for each one of them. That's the method. It's a generalization of the signs that you would get in a simplicial uh, uh, boundary. Uh, look at the first one. Going to the first, going, changing the first A has a plus sign, but changing the second A has a minus sign because there's one A preceding it. And changing the third A has a plus sign because there are two A's preceding it. So it goes plus, minus, plus. And that's what happens all the way along, uh, uh, but you're checking it only in relation to the A's 
and ignoring the beads. That's the way the sign goes into the boundary, okay? Um, so we've now defined the Kavana phomology, but we want to see a number of things about it. I have here a little slide that I might go back to. I'll just refer it to you for a moment. I've done a little calculation here to find out how this peculiar Q bracket behaves when you do rhytomized removes. It's an exercise you might want to do if you're, if you're tracking this. You see that under the first rhytomized remove, it multiplies by Q inverse, inverse, but under the other first rhytomized remove, it multiplies by minus Q squared. A uh, little strange, right? Under a second rhytomized remove, it multiplies by a minus Q. And under a third rhytomized remove, it's invariant. So if you think about what that would mean in terms of the chain complexes, you see that certain gradings are getting shifted. We'll have to talk about it later, but you might do this exercise. I'm going to skip that slide and come back to it. But now, here's our situation. We have a category whose objects are the states, and we have morphisms generated by arrows that go from, um, from a state with a given number of Bs to a state with one more. And, an, and we're going to think about these arrows as elementary cobordisms. This turns out to be extraordinarily useful. So in this case, where I have a multiplication and I go from two loops to one, I think of this as going through a saddle point that takes two loops to one loop. And the morphism is then a cobordism between one manifolds. And of course, if it went the other way, the coproduct, then it would be a similarly a saddle point morphism. So I have a lot of saddle point morphisms. And, and so if I had an example like this, um, then you see that if I were to go through a composition of morphisms, then I would be going through two saddle points. And if I went through the other composition of morphisms, this is a little Covano complex here that you're looking at. Um, if I went through the other composition of two morphisms, why then I would be going through a, a perhaps a slightly different looking um, um, cobordism. And what do I want about this mapping, these mappings that I have defined? What I want is to check that the, these diagrams commute. It's perhaps easier to see what I'm asking for if you look at it this way. I have two smoothings that can be performed. And I may do one of them first and the other one. That would be going up along the top. Or I can do this one first and then this one, and that would be going along the bottom. So uh, I want those two diagrams to commute. Let's see what I have here in the case of these diagrams. I claim I'm doing boundary one first. And as you see, indeed, I am. I'm going through this saddle point first. And then I'm going through the second saddle point, which is a coproduct. In this case, I'm going through the second one and the number two first, and then I'm going through this one, which splits this into two. Now, the thing to notice is that at the level of the cobordisms, they're homeomorphic. These two surfaces that you're looking at are homeomorphic. Just pull those saddle points back a little bit and you have this, or take these two saddle points and shift them down past one another and you have this, or you could have shifted them down past one another in the other direction. There's one other diagram that has not been drawn. So at the level of cobordisms, all these squares will commute because they will give homeomorphic surfaces. And that means that back in a Kovanov complex, if you look at it, every, every square of morphisms that you would like to commute will commute at the level of morphisms in a cobordism category. 
So we're going to also be talking about a cobordism category that is associated with the Kovanov category. And we're going to see that everything is fine in the cobordism category because of the observation that I just made. All the squares will commute. Why do I want the squares to commute? Well, the answer is that I want these squares to commute at the level at which I'm speaking to you about this because I want it to be the case that the boundary, the different boundary mappings commute with one another. That will make sure that the square of the boundary mapping algebraically is zero. I'll come back to the details of that in a moment. But, um, but at the level of the cobordisms, it's already there. And so what we can do is see that it works algebraically. Now, I started talking in the slideshow about the general cobordism category, and I'll come back to it. What I wanted to do was verify, oh, I see, I didn't verify it in this slideshow. That's interesting. Um, um, because I wanted to be more abstract. Well, that's all fine and good, but I think we ought to do an exercise about this algebra before I get so nice and abstract. So let me shift to, add. There's a, Lou? Yeah. There's a bit of conflict between your desires. At one level, you want the squares to commute, which is true in the Frobenius algebra. At the other levels, you want the squares to anti-commute. So no, no, no. Bound squared is no, zero. No, no, it goes in two stages. Okay. I didn't say this, but I said it. I want the squares to commute before I put in the signs, and then they will anti-commute automatically. Okay, okay. I told you the signs, but I didn't write them in this slideshow. The signs automatically make the squares anti-commute as long as they commute if I don't put in the signs. It's all very simple. Thank you, thank you. Right, now uh, let, me, uh, let me bring up a pad to write on. Yep. Okay. So, so we were, we we're going to look at, um, at this situation where I have these two possibilities. And I'm going to look at the two ways in which I could do them, in which order I could do them. So I may do this one first, which means that I would go through a co-product first. And then I would go through this one. Or I might do it in the other order, in which case I would go through this one. And then I would go through a co-product. Uh, and now let's just do some uh, examples here and see that it's working. Remember that we're working with this algebra, Z of X modulo X squared and delta of x is x tensor x and delta of one is one tensor x plus x tensor one. Um, and let's see, suppose that I started with x and x, right? Then uh, this would be x tensor x and x comes along and um, and now I have x squared is zero and x. So this should come out zero. And here I have 
x tensor x and x squared is zero, and this will come out zero. So that was easy. I won't do every case. Wait, 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 but, wait, wait. What but, about the, so you have, oh, 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 you take the product of the elements. In the sorry, proof, uh, proof by erasure is very effective, isn't it? Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, but uh, just do it in your head. If you have an X here and you have an X here, yeah. then then uh, then delta of X is X tensor X. So you have all X's along the bottom. But this is X times X, which is zero. And here you have a tensor product. So it's zero. Oh, OK, OK. okay. You, fed, you fed zero this way. Yeah. Here, here you have X and X. And X times X is immediately zero. A more interesting case. What, whoop. Sorry. Come back here. A more interesting case would be one and one. Definitely more interesting. One and one. So then you have um, uh, here in the middle, I'm going to have x tensor one and one tensor x. So I have x one, or I have one x, and here I have one, right? And now I'm going to multiply. So I have two cases here. There's a sum, x tensor 1 plus 1 tensor x. And so what I have in the middle there is x tensor 1 tensor 1 plus 1 tensor x tensor 1, right? And then I'm going to be multiplying these two to get to the bottom. So that gives me x tensor 1 plus 1 tensor x. OK. And over here, 1 and 1. And then these multiply to give you 1. And then again, I get this. So it works. And you can check the other cases. It really works. This algebra is tracking exactly so that uh, it assigns to cobordisms that are homeomorphic, the same mapping at the algebra level. So it's amusing to, to examine that. Um, while we're, uh, any other question about this or any other substitution you would like to see done? Okay. Um, uh, wait, let me erase in this fashion. As long as we're taking cobordisms uh, seriously here, um, then uh, then you uh, you may ask, well, what about things like this? Just looking at cobordisms as morphisms, you might have something like this. So, what 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 are we going to call this? This is this is the module V here. And the ground ring in this case is Z. So this ought to be a mapping from Z into the module. And we haven't defined it yet. But however we're going to define it, let's call it epsilon, co-unit. Um, however we define it, it should have the property that if you started with an A here, you would end up with A here should because there it's homeomorphic to a tube. So um, so let's find out uh, how it does behave, well, how epsilon should behave on something that we could try out. So for example, suppose that I have a one here um, uh, and here I have epsilon of, well, one. All right, um, one being the element that I'm testing in Z. I only need to test one in any case. So, so then I have, I have, uh, I have epsilon of one, whatever it is. Here I have one, 
And now at this level, which is the bottom level, I have epsilon of one multiplied by one. And that should be equal to one. And so therefore epsilon of one is equal to one. Good. Uh, rather than do proof by erasure, I better do another diagram or X. So now I have X. And so we have X here and we have epsilon of one. And epsilon of one times X is equal to X. So, so that's fine. It's still one. Um, and so I have epsilon of one is equal to one. Now, but I also, no, let me see. That's all I need. Um, am I forgetting anything? Co-unit. Yep. That's, so, um, uh, I'm sorry, that's the unit, not the co-unit. And I don't like to call it epsilon. Or I'll call it eta. But I need the co-unit. So you think you're thinking about it as a unit. Um, it should be epsilon. Yeah, so unit. It's the unit. It's the unit. And um, you just think of the unit in the module as as coming from the. Uh, this is the trivial point, right? I mean, the unit in the module is the is what happens to one in the base ring, and and it should take one to one, and then everything works fine. That's all we're observing, but. Uh, but now we also have to think about this, which is more interesting. So this one is going to be mapping from, from the module to the base ring. And that's the one that I prefer to call epsilon, and this is co-unit. Okay, uh, so now let's look at the two cases of one and x. Suppose that I use uh, x. Then I would have x tensor x because that's what happens to x under the coproduct. And, um, and then I would have epsilon of x, whatever that is in the base ring, and here's x. And we want that epsilon of x multiplied by x should be equal to x. So we're going to have that epsilon of x is equal to one. But that was a mm -hmm. Now, what about last case? One. Well, at this level, we have one tensor x plus x tensor one because that's the co-product of one. And then uh, we're going to be applying epsilon. So we're going to get epsilon of one times X plus epsilon of X times one. And we already know that epsilon of X, um, epsilon of X is equal to one. So we get epsilon of one times X plus one. And that implies that epsilon of one is equal to zero. And, and so now we have our algebra uh, equipped with a co-product uh, uh, with uh, our algebra is equipped with a co-unit and with a unit. And we best remember that the co-unit does this to X and does that to one and do another little bit of exercise on this just for the heck of it. So let me erase this and do it again. So what did I found? find? I found that epsilon of X is equal to one and epsilon of one is equal to zero. And you can continue on now and, and try some other examples to see how things work. For example, what happens if you had a sphere um, and you started, let's say, 
with a one here, uh, and then you form uh, the co-unit applied to the one, and you get a one, and then you take the epsilon of one, oh, um, and you, and you get zero. That's right. So if you had a, a little, uh, if you had a little surface consisting of just a sphere, you'll get zero. Zero sphere. The value of a sphere that occurred in the middle of some cobordism is going to be zero. What about a torus? Could start with a one. We'd have a one. Then we have a co-product happening. So this is one tensor X plus X tensor one. And then we are going to evaluate that. I mean, we're going to go through um, a multiplication and this gives me two X. And then I'm going to evaluate and I get two. So the value of a torus is two. And you want to see what would happen with the higher genus surfaces. So let's see what happens with a double torus. So I'll start with a one. And I get in a one. And then I apply the co-product and I get the same thing, one tensor X plus X tensor one. And then I go down to this little waistband here and I have two X. And then I do a co-product and I get two times X tensor X. And then I do a product and I get zero. And I get zero. So a double torus, zero. And all the higher genus surfaces, zero, for the same reason. So the torus is special here. It's the only one that uh, they get singled out in the course of a cobordism and ends up getting a two in it, like that. Um, now, I said Frobenius algebra, and I just want to give you a hint about where Frobenius algebra comes from. So if you started where we are and and noted the following, then you begin to see where it look, what it might look like to an algebraist. There's a pairing. If you started with V tensor V, then you can multiply and get to V, and then you can apply the co-unit and get back to the ground ring. And so we have a pairing from V tensor V to the ground ring, which is in this case, epsilon composed with M. So you can say that the pairing on two algebra elements A and B is equal to the product of, uh, I'm sorry, put that backwards. equal to epsilon of the product AB. And, and that has some um, that has some general algebraic properties. For example, if you if you took an element in if if uh, n belonged to the integers and you took a times n and uh, and took its product with B uh, then it would be the same as A and NB. Um, and if you if you had a third element in the in the ring itself, and you put in the module itself, you put A C times B, then you're going to get the same thing as A times C because it's a social it's a social equation. And so and so um, and so if you look up Frobenius algebra um, in a book or on the wiki, you will see that one definition that it starts with is that there is a module with a with with uh, with a, a with a non singular pairing that has some algebraic properties like that, and uh, and that if you get the right list of such algebraic properties, then 
the other facts that it has a co-product and so on and the co-unit all comes along. And so we've started at the other end and, and started with algebras that are defined in terms of these cobordisms, but it goes both ways. All right. So I'm being a little vague about that algebra definition, but that's 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 the where it comes from. And originally people defined the algebras uh, with the right properties for reasons that had nothing to do with cobordisms of surfaces. So with that in mind, oh, there was Scott's question. I think I want to address it for a moment. I've checked that all the squares, given that you check that the Frobenius algebra is really working, we, we essentially have checked that all the squares commute if you didn't put in any signs. Now let's look at, um, at what would happen. Um, let's just take three A's. Three A's could go to a B and an A and an A. And that might go to a B and a B and an A, just to, just for the sake of looking at this. Um, and, and going around the other side of the square, uh, this would go to an A and a B and an A, and that would go to a B and a B and an A. Now I said that I will assign a minus sign to one of these uh, guys if the smoothing change has preceding the A an odd number of A's. In this case, that's a plus. And now here, the change is here. And this is preceded by, again, an odd number of, uh, an even number of A's. And so this will be a plus. On the other hand, when you did this one, it's preceded by an odd number of A's and it gets a minus when it goes to here. And then this one uh, is preceded by an even number of A's and gets a plus sign. And so you see that you get one change in sign across the uh, square. And this will always be the case. So once you put the signs in, then, uh, then all the squares will anti-commute. Now, why do I need the squares to commute in order for the boundary to work? Well, imagine that you're looking in some place and you have a bunch of these coming out like this. Boundary one, boundary two, boundary n. Um, maybe you should think of the boundary i's as defined, hmm, sorry. Um, I wanna make this clear, so let me, um, Start again for the rest of that. Yeah. Let's just consider oops, a string of A's, which is at the at the beginning of the complex. And let's define boundary I of this boundary. No, I don't want to talk about applying a boundary to it, but there is a mapping from the object which corresponds to it, an ith boundary, which will take it to an object where one B has been changed in the ith place, okay? Uh, though that's the way we define the map, right? And in general, if there is an A in the i place here, then it could be changed to a B here. And, and I will continue to call these boundary I. So that means that, for example, that if I had two A's and I went here by boundary one to B A, and then I went by boundary two to B B, then I'm calling it boundary two just because it's happening in the second place, all right? And if I went by boundary two here, then 
uh, I would change this. And then this would go by boundary one, all right? So, so then you see that what I'm after when I want to talk about one of these squares commuting is that boundary I, boundary J should be equal to boundary J, boundary I, not putting in the signs yet. Good enough. And then the boundary map is going to be equal to the sum of, um, of plus or minus times the boundary I's. And in the first instance, it's just boundary one minus boundary two plus boundary three and so on. But later on, when there are some B's, you're counting only the A's that are involved here. So the signs will change a little bit. But I'm only concerned with it without sign. And I want to see what it means for the boundary without signs, if it is the case that boundary I, boundary J, is equal to boundary J, boundary I. And, and you will see that that means that when you do boundary twice, you're going to get the sum on I of boundary I composed with boundary J over all I. And we're going to be assuming that boundary I, boundary J is equal to boundary J, boundary I for I not equal to J. And so, and, and, and you're also boundary I, boundary I is equal to zero by definition. I'm just talking about the way, it, the way this thing works in detail if you wanted to think about it. Because you see, if you do boundary I and you try to do it again, it's not there. The way I've notated, it's simply not there because you don't get to smooth the B. So by definition, boundary I, boundary I is equal to zero. And so this is going to be equal to the sum on I of, uh, on I different from J of boundary I, boundary J. And if you know that boundary I, boundary J is equal to boundary J, boundary I, then that means that you're going to get the sum over I less than J of twice boundary I, boundary J. So mod two, it's quite clear that B squared is equal to zero. And, the, and if you put in the signs, then boundary I, boundary J is equal to minus boundary J, boundary I, when I is not equal to J. And then again, you have boundary, boundary equal to zero. So in, all, in either the mod two case or the integral case, you have the boundary composed with boundary will be equal to zero. As long as you check that before putting in the signs, these commute, and that's what we did check, okay? So, so now what I'm going to talk about is the cobordism structure for a little while. And so, this was Dror's idea to turn it into a, a categorical cobordism structure that looks like a chain complex. And it's probably better for me to just point to the right thing uh, and say it rather than try to make the definition. So here we are. You're looking at this little category and you know that if you take the direct sum of these modules, then you get a chain complex and that chain complex is the one that we're thinking about. On the other hand, um, suppose that I wish to think of it in a purely categorical way uh, as cobordisms. Well, you also can visualize that. You have every, for every little error, you have a, 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 a cobordism. If you take any composition of arrows, then you get a cobordism, which starts in this one manifold and ends in that one. And along all these squares, the cobordisms commute up the homeomorphism. What I need in order to get an analog of the chain complex is a notion 
of direct sums. So I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to have modules in here, but I would like to be able to turn this collection of maps into one single map that goes from uh, an object here to an object here. That means that I should formally allow myself to add the maps. And I should formally allow myself to take direct sums of these objects to get a brand new object that consists of the direct sum of all three of these. The definition is just as though you had done it um, because formally forming a direct sum is like taking a triple, right? And so you take triples, uh, you take a triple for these objects and you put in all the maps that you would want, just like you do by elements. An element here goes to an element here, an element here, and an element here. And you have one map instead of the three. You can put in the signs if you want to. So you can think of the whole thing as a brand new category associated with this, which is obtained by taking the direct sum of these, the direct sum of these, and having a map which has the appropriate signs in it. If you're over the integers, there will be one map from this object to this object, another from here to here, and another from there to there. And it's all defined at the level of the categories and the cobordism mappings. And now, uh, what is the advantage of that? The advantage of that is that if I wish to think about how to compare one chain complex to another, then I can think about it in terms of the cobordisms directly. And I, I no longer can take the homology, however, because I don't know what a kernel means and I don't know what a co-kernel means. I don't know what it means to have a cycle, but I can compare them up to homotopy. I can compare them by looking at the chain homotopy type and the possible chain homotopy equivalents of one chain complex to another. You're gonna see this in an example in a moment and it will become clear. So I wish to remind you um, what I mean by chain homotopy. And here I'm uh, maybe not taking perfect care of signs, but if I have uh, two mappings between two complexes, F and G, uh, then I say that those two mappings are chain homotopy equivalent if there is a, a mapping which takes the grading up by one, right? Um, or, or down by one in this case, since we're dealing with, um, with cohomological kinds of grading. But, you know, you would take N cells to N plus one cells by the homotopy. Uh, and the boundary H plus H boundary should be the difference of the two mappings. It is in fact, a picture of what happens when you have a homotopy. I best remind you. If you have a mapping F and another mapping G into some space, and you have a homotopy between them, then you have a mapping of the space, you have a mapping X into Y, uh, and you have a homotopy between them, then you have a mapping of X cross I into Y. You have two mappings on X, and it should restrict on the top to F and on the bottom to G. Then you get this mapping, and that means that um, that you get a mapping of a one higher dimensional object into the space. And then uh, what is happening to H? Uh, and what is happening to this? Along the boundary, you're getting F restricted to the boundary of X, whatever uh, X might be. And along the other side, you're getting F minus G. And so at the level of algebra formalism, um, you, you, if you think of, maybe we should think of this as H, then you have that boundary H plus H boundary is equal to F minus G is the algebraic image of that. I'd better leave it at that. But the point is that 
at the chain complex level, that's what corresponds to a homotopy and uh, a homotopy of maps. And this we can talk about without having to take kernels and co-kernels. And so we can examine whether or not one of these complexes is a homotopy equivalent to the other by doing that, by looking for a homotopy equivalent. So now I want to look at a second Rhytomized <laughs> move and think about what it's going to mean for this homology to be invariant. So I have jumped from, I, I could have done more concrete calculation of homology for you, um, but I decided to talk about why it's invariant first, and we're almost out of time. So this is a good point to concentrate on this, and we'll continue it next time. But let's examine this. Here is, here is the second Reitermeister move. And if you form, now, um, this is the A smoothing, and this is the A smoothing. So I've written the two A smoothings, and then I've gone through the a corresponding little bit of Kovanov complex that you're going to see as a result of a second Reitermeister move. And on the other hand, here is what the complex would look like locally um, if there was no move performed. So I'm writing empty, empty here, and I just have this. And there, of course, the rest of it is not illustrated. But if you're going to compare these two categories, then you have to somehow compare this category with this one, where what corresponds to this seem to be two objects over here, and then there are some objects to the either side. Um, and um, and if, you had, if you had had the idea originally that maybe I could just compare the categories, you see that you're in trouble without going to something like a chain complex because of the fact that you would like a mapping from this category to this category, and there's no way to get this object to go to two objects. But if we took the direct sum con construction, which is what we did, we're taking the direct sum of this and this, the direct sum of these modules, then it's possible to take a mapping from here into the direct sum. So by taking the corresponding canopy, which is Dror's term for it, the, it's not quite a chain complex, but it is a collapse of this category and also an extension of it by allowing us to add morphisms. So then it's possible to compare these two categories. And what we're going to find out is that these two categories are chain homotopy equivalent, and that's why it ends up being invariant. But let's look, just look carefully at this and see how things are working. I want to get a mapping from here to here. And the natural way to get a mapping from this guy to this guy is to leave it alone and just map it in because they're identical. But what about from here to here? Well, I need a cobordism. I can create. I can always create a circle by a cobordism. Um, I can create a circle by a cobordism and get from here to here by starting with nothing and going through a little cap and ending up over here with a circle. What does it look like? I see. I needed this board. It's going to look like this. Here's somebody with a circle, and that circle is dying out, and this is coming along like that. And so this will give, this gives me an example of a morphism from here to here. Okay? So, so by thinking at this categorical level, you're thinking at a more geometrical level about how to compare the complexes. So uh, I can go from here to here by giving birth to a circle, and I can go from here to here by just the identity. Um, and, um, and so I can take the direct sum of those two maps and go into the direct sum and get a mapping from this category to this category, thought of as a canopy. And uh, and of course, I want a mapping the other way as well. So I wish to map from here to here, and that can be the identity, but this one will have to get the circle to go away. Um, 
and um, and so I have mappings forward and back. And the mappings on this side are the identity. I seem to have turned myself by 90 degrees in this diagram. You'll pardon me, but it's the same. This goes identically to that one, and this one gives birth or dies a circle. Um, the, the part that I need to look at is what happens if I go up and come back. And if I go up and come back in this direction, I have the identity. But if I go, um, if I go down and back up, I get a self-mapping of this to itself, and I want to see about its homotopy properties. Um, I need to see that it's homotopic to the identity, because that's what will tell me that I have a homotopy equivalence. If I have to find a map here and a map here, and this composition is the identity, and this composition is homotopic to the identity, then I have a homotopy equivalence between one complex and the other. So. I have to look at the mapping that goes from this to this. And I need a homotopy. And in order to have a homotopy, I have to go upward into the complex. But upward is backward in this case. I go from C1 to C0 and from C2 to C1. And the question is, how can I get a homotopy? Along the top line, there isn't anything happening, and I will, uh, I will ask you to to, oh, we're out of time. So let me tell you what they are. You see, the question is, how do I naturally get from here to here? And the answer is, <coughs> give birth to a circle. And how do I naturally get from here to here? The answer is, let a circle die. And then you can check what happens to the compositions of the maps. I'll start here next time. And you can examine what it would mean to have the homotopy and ignoring signs, this is what it would mean to have the homotopy. And you check what it means by writing out all the diagrams for the homotopy. And you find out that this is what it reads. That you need that this sum of cobordisms needs to be happening. And this, this is where uh, Drawer made a remarkable observation in some order. I don't know if he made it in the order that I'm making it here. Here I'm saying, I tried to get the homotopy to happen, <clears throat> not knowing uh, anything other than what, <coughs> what it would draw out to be. And I find this picture. <coughs> and I ask myself, what general fact about the cobordisms would imply this picture? And the answer is, very beautiful. So it's worth taking a moment and seeing what it is. The answer is if you have four bits of surface and you think of putting a tube between all four of them, one tube between all pairs, between this pair, between this pair, from here to here, and from here to here, going around in this pattern, one to two, two and three, one and four, and three and four, like that. That is and adding them up, that is the identity that we were talking about. This part of the tube came from a cobordism. These came from births and deaths. If you're, but this is one of the tubings. Here's the other tubing, and so on. So it fits into the pattern one, two, three, four, like this. One and two minus two and three plus three and four minus one and four equals zero. Where those are the extra tubes added. Drawer calls that the four tube relation. And what we're seeing is that if in the cobordisms, the four tube relation were satisfied, then it would be invariant under the second Reitermeister move. Well, we have to talk about the third Reitermeister move and we have to quit because we're out of time. But what we're about, what we're now going to see once we go back to it next week is that the Frobenius algebra does satisfy this four tube relation. So you now have two directions in which you can go for understanding Covano homology. One is the algebraic one. The algebra works and satisfies the relation and so will give you something that's invariant. Or you can think of it entirely as a cobordism theory of categories uh, where you take chain equivalences of those uh, associated categories and that 
chromatopy type of category is the substitute for carvanophomology and is the invariant. I'll stop there. Thank you. This four tube relation also looks like a, uh, a boundary operator of something. It does. Uh, so I would like to know whether it is, uh, or it looks like a, a co-cycle or something. It, it looks like right. it belongs right. in, it definitely looks like it belongs in a larger context. I'm not quite sure what the context might be. Maybe between now and next week, we could figure that out. <laughs> Okay, um, I think uh, perhaps I, I ought to draw, you know, things to a conclusion. Uh, uh, indeed. We've got plenty of time next week to uh, discuss any questions you have. Exactly. So I'm going to stop recording now. Um, and uh, thank uh, Lou again. Thanks. <laughs>